How many of you are ready for the word this morning? Amen. It has been a rich, rich week. I have been uh, tremendously blessed. And so I just want us to stand this morning and to welcome uh, Pastor Alex, Judy, and uh, prepare our hearts to receive what he has for us this morning. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Lord. I was just smiling the way you've pronounced or written down my name. (laughs) Well, Ak said maybe. Yeah. 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 Um, I want to thank God for bringing me to the United States of America. And I know God has a plan for all of us including myself. Uh, My coming to this place, it's God who gave me the directions. And I decided and purposed this year that I was kind of tired with the kind of life I lived and thought, God, what's my next move? So, there's something I'd learned about the United States of America. That it was founded on God. So, George Washington had trusted this nation into the hands of God. So, what we see here in the United States of America is not the people's doing. It's God's doing, fulfilling his word, which he was entrusted this nation into by supplying in abundance. You people may not know the abundance in which God is supplying to your nation. But if you want to make a check on that, see how many people are scrambling to come to the United States of America. That's when you can know there's something unique about the USA. To me, I'm looking for the spiritual. If there is plenty on the land, it simply means there is plenty in the heavenlies. So it's the heavenlies that determine the physical. So I purposed to come to United States of America with an open heart to come and draw from the spiritual realm away from home, where there is abundance being manifest. I stand on the abundance being manifest. Then I link up with the spiritual, and I draw as much as I can. Why? Because I needed something greater than that had already been established in my place, in my country. So by so doing, I told God that, and I told him, this year, take me out of this nation to the United States of America. And to prove that he actually did, it all started with coming to the United States of America We require a large sum of money. Those who have traveled, you know what I'm talking about. So that's not the kind of money uh, we can raise or I can raise myself. So I allowed God to do that. And so, I can't raise money without a visa. So we were many of us, we were about 65 from our nation, wanted to come to USA, dotted all over uh, cities in Bungoma. Bungoma, Nairobi, Eldoret, Mombasa, and all places. But out of 65, 11 of us got the visas. But for me, I had all my papers ready. I went to the embassy and they asked me, where are you going? I told them where I was going. For how long? I told them for how long. And are you married? I said, yes. How many children? I told them. Then he laughed. He said, 
go have fun. So he didn't ask me for anything else. So I stood there, I didn't understand why he's telling I have fun. I have not given him my documents. But he said, no, 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 go, go have fun. You have given you the visa already, five-year visa. So praise the Lord. So I walked out of that place not believing. But I remembered the promise I had with God. All things are possible with God. Amen. So when I went back for the funds, the funds were available. So I did not struggle to raise the funds to come to the United States of America. Then I knew there is something God wants to do in my life for what I'm going to do back home. When I got here, I didn't know because my aim was that if so, also I can get to the capital city of the United States of America and make my prayer there because that's the central of the USA. Little did I know that somebody else was already making plans for me to go there through Andrea. So Andrea tells me, I feel, you know what? We have tickets to go to uh, the capital in the um, capital city, to go to Capitol, capital Hill, that, that, that building. So I said, well, it's all well with us. And I was there, and we go to the memorial uh, monument, and we held hands, those who were there, it was Andrea, Bobby, and the, their son, and we held hands, and I prayed exactly what my purpose was here in the United States. Praise the name of the living God. Um, my name is Alex Achuti. I'm a pastor uh, with a church called Kingdom Life Chapel in Bungoma. And um, I am married to my beautiful lady called Joy. Uh, and God has blessed us with a number of children. I know if I say the number here, you might think <laughs> here you are used to one, two, but it's not more, it's not, it's not two, <laughs> it's not even three. <laughs> Can I continue? <laughs> Five. <laughs> um, so I have four girls and one boy. And some of them are grown, and God has also added an input in my family. Now I have grandchildren, yes. So I have grandsons, two of them, and God is good. So I have come so that I can share what God told me to share when I came here into this church. So we walked around in the church, I saw the church and then Pastor Andre asked me, what, what do you feel? I said, right now I don't feel anything, but in case I do, I'll let you know. So we walked around, then I'm going to tell you what the Lord showed me. Amen. All right, today I'm ready to speak this word. It's in line with what I was shown. So the scripture is Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 to 19. Isaiah chapter 43, 18 to 19. Isaiah 43, verse number 18 to 19. Are we there? Yeah. All right. I'm reading from this American standard, I think. Yeah, the American standard. So it says, Do not call to mind the former things or ponder things of the past. 19 says, Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? 
I will even make roadways in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. So I just want to pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, this is your word. And I'm your servant. And these are your children. Holy Spirit, take charge. Teach us, counsel us, and help us understand what you are speaking to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, God is speaking to the children of Israel. He's telling them about, do not remember the former things. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. So, don't remember the past. Focus on the future. In other words, he's telling them, the things you have seen me do, don't just center on them. Even that is not the same I'm going to do tomorrow. I could do something else different. Be on the lookout. I'm going to do something different. Even greater than what you have seen. So when I was here, I stood and somewhere around there, I saw there was a, a bamboo. But the bamboo had been watered for a very long time and had not sprouted. So it didn't matter to me much. But when I was leaving, I got up to that door and it's like I was turned around and I said, no, let's go and pray right now. And we rushed over to this place. And immediately I was forced to go on my knees. And I started praying. Some of the words I can't remember. But what I remember is that God, what is it that you are speaking about? But I don't remember the other words I prayed. But in the end, it was that for a long time, the bamboo has been underground and has not even shown any germination, but it has been watered. But now it was time that it blossomed and it came and grew and became big and I kind of got violent when I was there. Then it was that way. Then when I finished, the scripture came in my mind, Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19. So in other words, if it came in this church, then it must have something to do with the church. So maybe in this church, you have been wanting something. It can be the church as the river, or it can be the church as the individuals who come to fellowship here. Or it can be the families that come to fellowship here. It may mean any of those. But the point here is that for a long time, there has been something the church had wanted to do. There must be something families have wanted to do. There must be something maybe you as an individual had wanted to do, but has not been coming forth. And now it's like it's a, a dispensation that God has made that it may be spoken and it breaks forth and it starts germinating. So germination needs conditions. And those conditions for anything to germinate has to be that the ground is prepared well. And then the seed is planted. Now, the man or the person who plants does not make it grow. But he has hopes. He has expectations. But the growth does not belong to him. That's why even Paul says that I have planted and you have watered, but the one who matters most is the one who makes it grow. So there are things that you don't have any hold of. There are some things you cannot control them with the things you have. But these things need you to give them to God. And once you've given them to God, expecting not from the things, but expecting from God, because then him is the only one who can make them grow. 
is the only one who can make it come out so that when you look at it, it is attractive to each and every one who sets eyes on it. It is attracting and making the people feel, yes, this is the right thing. God says that when he blesses, he adds no sorrows. And so, this bamboo has been dormant for many years. I don't know about what it is with your church. I don't know what it is with the family. I don't know what it is with the individuals. But there are issues that has been going on for too long. And God is saying, this is the time that he wants to put an end to that and people to see something different. Praise the Lord. Um, I, I want to say whether there's a family here. It's a family of two. Two children. A family of two children. And they had come to an end. They feel we've tried so many things. It's a family of two. We have tried so many things. But each time we feel there is an end to it. And they are trying to see how can we go beyond where we are. It could be issues you've been having in the family. But the two, a family of two, uh, God is saying there's a breakthrough for you today. So I'll be praying with that family as we go by. Uh, also, I'll be praying with uh, one, no, I'll be praying also with the two people who have been pegged on two opinions. Uh, does this thing really work? Maybe not. But anyway, let me just hang on there. I'm saying this as I'm speaking to you. It's hit you already. And you say, that must be me. You've been pegged on two opinions. And God wants to handle that today. Because yours has been a cry for too long. So God wants to hold it, handle that today. So I'll come to you in a little while. But I want to go to uh, the scripture here. If we can get the concept of the scripture and get what God is speaking to us, then from there we can move together. God is speaking about his children who were in bondage in Egypt. And now he promised them. He told them, I'm taking you to the promised land, a land that is full of milk and honey. God, when he's speaking to them, they're in bondage. Now, the promised land is out of Egypt. So these people will see the goodness of milk and honey. They'll see how free they are from limitations and bondage. So this excitement that they have been told will make them want to leave Egypt. But, you know, there has to be a step for them to leave Egypt to go to the promised land. The promised land has milk and honey. The promised land, there's freedom. The promised land, there's no slavery. You are not being forced to do things that you don't want to do. But in, the, in Egypt, you are being forced to do things you don't want to do. But you have to do them because you are in bondage. So this transition from bondage to freedom is quite hectic. And so it was that they had to pass through the desert. Desert is a dry place. This is a place you don't know whether to go left, right, front, backwards. And God wanted to reveal himself in this state. When they were in bondage, they could not think. They were not allowed to think anyway. But in the desert, they would want to think because they don't know where they are going to. Where they are going to, it's only God who knows. So God wants them to come to realization, I am God who created you and who is taking you out of bondage, taking you to the 
promised land. Now, it happened, they came out, but they saw the wonders of God, the deliverer. They saw God parting the Red Sea. That was wonderful to them. And we are told they sang Song of Salvation after that. But as they continued, when they were in the desert, where now God wanted to reveal himself to them, that is where they started complaining. They even told Moses, please, take us back. It is better where we were because we could eat well and there were all the facilities. And even burial, we could be buried nicely. But here in the desert, it's no good. Take us back. So here God is trying to tell us this or is actually ministering to us that even us who are even here today, we don't want to go to new places. In other words, you don't want to make a move because you don't know where you are going. So you would hold to where you are and say, I would rather be here, right? So I don't know. I'm trying to give you the picture. Like you could say, what are the former things? What are these former things? Maybe I'm referring to here as we are here. Uh, the former things could be maybe you've had issues. <coughs> maybe issues with your husband, your wife. You had issues with your parents when you were growing up. You had issues with your guardians as you were coming, growing up also. And these are some of the things that were imprinted in your heart. They are in your heart even right now. And whenever anything is about to happen to you, something good, the enemy turns your heart back to the affliction. So you would look at the affliction and say, these parents of mine or my parents never treated me right. And so you have anger in you. You don't want anything to do with them. And so it brings out another a, a cloud of darkness over your life so that even when God wants to bless you, you are not able to see what God is doing. And God is telling us, behold, I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? No. You cannot perceive it because your mind and your heart, which is supposed to reveal the intent of God and the purpose of God is already held up in those former things, in those old things. Maybe your last year was terrible. And when it got to a month like this, it was very bad. You went through issues. So it's come to the same. And instead of thinking of what God is going to do to you from this day forth, you are holding on to the grudges and to the other things that happened to you last year. So in that way, you may not see God moving in your life. Maybe you are here, you are physically abused, or you are sexually abused, and those things come into your mind and deter you from seeking God. So in that way, you don't move forward. So those are some of the things, the former things. You even judged them. Say that I'll never be like so-and-so. I'll never want anything to do with this so-and-so. After doing that, you never know the consequences of what you have done. We are all human beings. I know. There are times you get really angry. And before you realize, you have spoken about a thousand words before your mind tells you, you know what you have said is wrong? But then you say, okay. But you see, I had to do it. But you've already done it. You've already made that and eventually... What the word of God says is this. Maybe you can write that down. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 to 2. Matthew 7, 1 to 2. Matthew chapter 7, 1. I would like uh, uh, to read 1 and 2. And this is what the Bible says. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured 
to you? Have you seen some other things happening to you that you said, I will never do this? Hello? I will never do this. And that thing you said you will never do it is the same thing that is in your bedroom, in your house, in your business, in your family. It just comes back. And nobody can solve it for you. Even prayers cannot change it for you. Nothing can change it unless you realize this is where I went wrong. And you alone, now by the help of God, go back and undo the same thing by yourself. Nobody can pray for you and it goes out. But you need to identify it yourself and you do it. This happens with uh, also those who are maybe getting engaged, be engaged to a lady or a man, and then you say, I'll never want to get married to a man like this one. I'll never want to be married to a, a lady like this one. So all those things you do and say, they come back to you. I remember, I said I'll never want to be a pastor. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't want. Now here I am. Hello. Hello. I had to recognize it. I had to go back and I had to undo a lot of things. And God had called me and he said, I'm not giving up on you until it's done. So, you are here. We are going to pray over those things. Now, former things, they enslave you and they cannot make you move forward. And we have also seen some of the things that happened to the children of Israel when they came to the desert where God wanted to reveal himself fully who he was to them. Um, they were not. They complained. They murmured. They told Moses a lot of things. And so, in one area, in Numbers chapter 21, verse 9, uh, God sent fiery serpents, and they were biting them. They were killing them. You know, God did not want to kill his people. But the people themselves did not want God and without God, you die. So the children of Israel, they agreed with God. They were going to walk with him all the way to the promised land. When they got to the desert, where God wanted to reveal himself to them, they shunned away God. And so now, they grumbled and mumbled. They said, where is meat? Uh, this water is not good. Moses, you've betrayed us, can't bring us all the way from uh, Egypt and bring us to suffer on this place. And the Bible says God released serpents, fiery serpents to them. And they were biting them. They were dying. God wanted them to realize that it is him who is in charge here. So when the, many of them were dying, eventually those who were alive, they ran to Moses and said, Moses, tell that God of yours, we have agreed, we have sinned against him. And we have sinned also against you. And so Moses, that's when he made the serpent and he put it up on the cross. And they were told instructions, follow instructions. When you are beaten by a serpent, look up at the bronze serpent. And when you look at it, you shall receive healing. It doesn't look real by just looking up and you get healed and you've been beaten by a poisonous snake. It doesn't look real. But that's what it is. With God, sometimes it's not real. But by what you believe in your heart, that becomes real. So now, if you are beaten by a serpent, and you know you are going to die, I don't want to die yet. I look up. So whether I live, but I would have looked up, I would have followed instructions. If I die, I'll die looking up. But I know I tried looking up. So they looked up, and they were healed. So at times it might happen to us. The Bible is very clear. It says, if you are laden with all kinds of issues, he is the only one who can remove them from your back. He's the only one who knows which burdens you are carrying. You may not know, because some of them you don't even see them, because these are unseen forces that cling on to somebody. 
and they twist him and influence that person to do what is not right. But our God is a faithful God, and he is faithful to his word. If he says he will heal you, he'll definitely heal you. So maybe you've reached a point whereby you feel, okay, I have issues with me, but I don't know how to get out of this. Okay, maybe I'm one of those who have judged, but what do I do now? Maybe you are here and saying, okay, okay, now I see. But then what is next from this point forward? So one first and foremost thing is, is your relationship with God. That's first and foremost. Because this is the creator of heaven and earth. This is he who created heaven and earth. And you and me in his own image and likeness. So we can't push him aside. So he has to supply that we don't have. Let me give you an example here. In our country, we have prisoners. These are people who have broken the law and they've been taken in as inmates in a prison. They cannot see their people. Not, it's not like here. Here it's like home, you know. But there, <laughs> here it's not what I know is here. Here you even have television you watch. Here you, people visit you. No way. There you are there and you and you alone. Right? And the conditions are very harsh. Right? So you are there. Then in there, if you go to court and the court wants to release you, somebody must come from outside, not inside. So this person who comes from outside, he will come and bond you and you come out. Why? Because this person who has bonded you is now taking your place in prison. So he's also in prison, but outside, in order for the one who is in prison to go outside. So the one who was in prison could not be freed until the prison or the government was sure that they still have him when they need him because he's still in prison. But his body will move out, but his name is still imprisoned. And the only way his name, the only way he can be let go is somebody else to come from outside who has what it requires. That's a fine. You are told it's a bond of $1,000. So this person coming from outside must come with $1,000 and put it there as a bond that in case this person does not appear, the $1,000 will pay for the law he broke. Are we, are we getting it? So now this person from outside is also held up because of this man who has been let go. His money is there. Now this is what happens. In our day-to-day -day life, and as human beings, we are limited. So there are times we can't go beyond what we are. So we need somebody else who is superior than just a human being, superior than us, so that he can come in and help us and raise us to another level. And that's where your relationship with God is without actually we can't discuss about it because he created us. So he comes in and he helps us. I want to be helped. And so do you want to be helped. All of us want to be helped. And so he's the only one who can help us. What does he help us with? With some powers which we don't see. It's not like I'm here and I want a loan more than I can go to my neighbor and say, can you lend me for today? No. It's what I don't see. It's what I don't know. It's what is oppressing me without me understanding I'm being oppressed. It's things that make me go round and round and round, and I'm not going anywhere. But I don't see anything holding me here. It's things like, even, even with the relationship, I don't understand why I'm not relating well with you because I don't understand. It's things that are hidden that we cannot see with our natural eyes. And that's where God comes in and you tell him, God, I have this problem. I don't know what to do, but I, I need your help. 
That's when he'll help you. It's between you and him. It's not between me and, and any other. It doesn't matter those who are around me. It matters me and him. So my relationship is just between me and him. And that's where he comes in. That's where he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die because of our sins. That's where now our relationship is the one which will help us come out of those situations. Number two is that you recognize the problem. What is this problem that I have? What is this that is not making me feel fully to what I am supposed to be? I know. Um, there is a time I wanted to be, become a doctor. And so when things didn't work out well, I didn't become a doctor. But I felt deep inside me there is something, there's a big hole that has not been fulfilled. I was working, yes, but I still felt there's something missing. So that thing which was missing was that God was trying to incline me or lead me to pray for people who are sick. And the only place that was was in the hospital. So he led me to the hospital where I could pray for people and I get satisfaction deep inside me just by praying for people in the hospital. That's what I do even up to now. So I go to the hospital and pray for those who are there and share with them, counsel them, and I've seen God do great things there. And when I leave the hospital, ah, I feel good. I feel like I've done something. Because that hole within me is filled up. So maybe you are here and you are doing your work, you are doing stuff, but you feel my potential is not fully utilized. There is a missing link which you don't know and you don't understand it. But you feel, I think I should do something. Do you know what many people do? Say, okay, I'm going to pray. They pray, they feel good for that one day, two days. The vacuum becomes bigger. Okay, I'm going out for a trip. Where do I go? To Florida, maybe. So I go up to Florida. I enjoy the sun and, and I go into the sea. I do all kinds of things. I feel good. But when I come back, the vacuum is still there. So that's what the vacuum we are talking about. Those are things you don't lay your hands on. You can't get hold of them. They are so hidden, you don't see them. So they just cause you that hunger. There's something I need to do. There's something I want to do. And the thought comes, oh, go to the cinema. So you go to the cinema hall, you watch maybe Hercules or whatever. Then you come out feeling, oh, that was good. What do you think? It was good. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was good. But after two days, you feel, oh, I'm still. <laughs> now, recognize what is it that you feel you need to deal with. What is it that has been taking you in circles? What is it that has been taking you in about turns and you're not moving straight? Then we'll pray on that. And Matthew eleven twenty eight says, uh, bring them to me, those who are heavily laden, and I'll give you rest. Then the other thing is uh, give up the former things. This year, <clears throat> when God ministered to me that I have to do things differently, um, I started doing them differently. Uh, why am I saying this? Because we are used to a pattern of work. Jump out of bed at six. I do A, B, C, D up to this time. I do this up to this time. Jump into the car, go to work. Lunch time I go to Mufflins or Wafflins, one of those eating joints. You eat there. Then come back home. When you get home, I need to be at home at this time. So it's programmed. So the results you have been getting, those results, if you are happy with them, I don't know. But I, I was not happy with the results I had. Like I told you, I was fed up. So this year, I had to do it differently. If it is waking up at four, at five, now I have to change. So I write all my plans for the day, like I've been doing. But now I want to change every plan. 
If I was waking up at four, uh, at five, I'd have to wake up at 4.30. Just to beat that pattern I had formed. Because doing the same thing the same way brings the same results. But doing one thing different ways, it will bring different results. So if all of us want different results, we have to break the pattern and give up the former ways that we have been working on. If you have been telling your wife, I love you, just once, now tell her about three times, right? And the wives also tell your husbands. The people, other people, tell your neighbors, oh, may God bless you. Bless them more, more times than it was before. Change something. Then you'll see different results. We see even Moses, when he wanted different results, he had to give up his life. He had to live up his life in the palace. He said, okay, I know in the palace there's everything, but I'm not going to stay here. There's everything he needed. He was a son. But he didn't want that. That vacuum in him was driving him to do something different. We also know other side of it. We know like Jabez. You've heard of Jabez. You've read about him. Jabez, the Bible says um, in First Chronicles 4.9, uh, he had to give up pain. It was pain, pain, pain. And everything was undergoing was pain. Everything is pain. Until he said, enough is enough. God bless me. And bless me indeed. You know, it had to go the other way around. It's not, my brother will help me. My cousin is in high authority. He'll help me. My relatives will help me. They can't help you because it's not them. You are not them. So, but if you go up there, then Jabez, when he went up there and he spoke to the Father in heaven, then the Bible says he became more honorable than all his brothers. So, who knows? God wants to do something different in you today. And he wants you to start it, kickstart it today. And then things are going to follow according to his pattern and not our pattern. But for us, we'll give them to him. And he's going to disorient all those good things we think we have been following and doing. All that love we think we have been giving to other people. We realize it was not love. It was just maybe, you know, it's a thing we are used to. Uh, allow me to say this, although it's not... Uh, um, I was saying in one of the homes, I said, look, how come when we just come into the house... We go straight to food, you know. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> no, I'm talking from a different culture. You get my point. So then I said, maybe when we get into the house, without even thinking, we have programmed ourselves. When I enter the house, I'll go straight to the juice. I'll go to the fruit. And I bring it at the table. I'll go to this other place, I'll get a sandwich, I'll bring it here, I'll go. It's all programmed. You don't even think about it. By the time you are thinking, you are going on and on. All right? Then I said, okay, can we say we change the plan? I get in the house, when my hand is going to the fridge, I said, wait a minute, can I do it differently today? Hello? Can we do it differently today? I'm not taking the, I'm not taking the sandwich now. But, but I'll take it at a later time because I want to break the pattern. I'm just, it's a suggestion. Uh, don't stone me when I'm living here. <laughs> it's just a, a pattern which we want to uh, give up because we want different results. Because we want to fill in that vacuum that is yearning for something which we don't know. But maybe by changing the pattern, we might ring a bell, something might ring a bell, in between might ring a bell. And then you say, okay, if I've dried up my thirst, because when I come in, I take the juice. So if I stop the juice, then that thirst may tell me something. Maybe God will speak to me. Or maybe something else will drop in that will lead me somewhere else. So, uh, just a thought. Then renew your mind. Renewing your mind means 
Start thinking differently because it is a sacrifice you have to make. So it is a sacrifice. Brethren, it's a sacrifice. Because if it's not a sacrifice, then it will not have a different dimension. I know you might feel, okay, why should I punish myself? This is my food. I bought it. I must eat it. Huh? It's yours. But it's just a sacrifice. Because you want to go to turn you to another dimension. You want to know what else is God speaking to me this time. Now, in Romans 12, 2, 12 verse 2, you can uh, write it down and you'll go and read it. You can read 1 and 2. It talks about do not conform yourself any longer to the pattern of this world. Any longer. Maybe you can change that and your mind can be renewed only by the word of God. Maybe just read the word of God. Uh, try to read a scripture a day. Try to read a scripture that is in, 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 in relevance to the situation you are in. And then God will speak to you through that scripture. That's the renewing of the mind so that he can lead you somewhere else. So what does God promise us? He says he's doing something new. Definitely he's doing something new, but I had not noticed, right? He's doing something new, but I had not noticed. So I want to be clear now. I want my ears to be up, my antennas to be raised so that I can hear what he's saying, what he's speaking. So like we said, it is from when he was taking them from slavery, when he was taking the children of Israel from slavery, he wanted to take them to freedom. Are we clear about that? Slavery to freedom. When you are free, then you have control. When you are free, you have control. So God did not want them to be under oppression. God wanted, because they were his children, he wanted them to dominate, to have dominion. What do they have dominion over? Dominion over all creation. So God's purpose right from the beginning was that they may have dominion over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, and every crawling animal on the earth. So in the three spheres of life, God wanted us or man to have dominion. And so I'm saying uh, it is our desire today that God restore that to us, that we start walking in dominion. Dominion meaning that whatever will want to dictate my life, that I will subdue it. And I will do what I think is right according to the word of God. Are we together there? So all of us, we want blessings. And we want to prosper. All of us, including myself. That's why I've come here. I've come to tap that which is here on your land. I've come to grab it. And I'm not letting go. I'm really drinking it. Ooh, I'm taking it in. So that when I go, I'll be a different person. So, all of us, including yourself, you want to prosper, you want to succeed, and because of that, um, God will do something different, and it's only God who will show you a way where there seemed to be no way. That's where he says, yes, you may be in the desert. Yes, you may be lacking. Yes, you may be unable to accomplish some things. But I'm doing a new thing. Where there seems to be no way, I'll make a way for you to come out. And he says, even in the desert, where there is no water, I'm going to bring springs of living water in the desert. So you'll not die of thirst. You'll drink, even when other people are not drinking. Because your heart has been realigned with him in heaven. So God is telling you to not to fear. Allow me to ask you to tell your neighbor, do not fear. Anything that God is going to lay on your heart, do not fear. So, where there are things that God wants us to acquire, fear comes in. So fear just blocks your way. That you say, I cannot do it because I have never done it. And yet it is God who has opened a way for you. So God wants to turn our mindset around so that 
we believe and trust in him that he is going to push us forward. He's going to take us forward. Because he says, he told the children of Israel, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he's still saying now that I will never leave you nor forsake you. So he has not left us. He's with us. Even as we are here, he's with us. And now he wants us not to fear. Not to fear venturing into new opportunities. There are some opportunities maybe God has brought your way. But you have feared to take up those opportunities because of fear. Maybe you don't know what people will say. Maybe there are some people who had done the same and they had failed. But remember, God says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You alone. You have your unique designs. And God, the way he has knit you, is not like somebody else. Where other people have failed, God maybe wants you to succeed. Where people have not ventured into, God has knit you such that you are the only one who can fit that opportunity. And when you are in that opportunity, then many others are going to venture into it because you went there and you were obedient to his word. So the, your prosperity could be hidden. Like he tells Cyrus that he'll hold his hand and assures him that he'll show him treasures hidden in secret places. So there are some secrets you don't see until you venture into those new opportunities. When you take fear out of your life, fear of the unknown. But God is faithful. He says in his love, his love, perfect love casts out fear. All right. Now, in your dry places, I'm just taking you around so that we know when we start praying, we know exactly what you are doing. In your dry areas of life, uh, we see that God is saying he'll make a way where there seems to be no way. And in the promised land, we see that this was land full of milk and honey, and God promised his children and yet it was surrounded by giants. There were giants there. What were giants doing in that promised land? They were protecting it. Something good is not just taken just like that. Hello? It's hidden. When you go to the bank, can you just walk into the bank and steal? Oh, no. It's all shielded. It's hidden because it's great treasures in there. Yeah? So it's all locked up. You can't just go in and steal. So the promised land is a place where your benefits are there. But the devil has made sure that he has put giants to block you from getting them. So those giants are the ones we are saying that with God, he shall go before you. And he will tear down those giants. That's when the children of Israel, the ten spies, when they came back, they told them, okay, it is true what God said. That land is full of milk and honey. Perfect, it's true. Even some of the uh, uh, fruits are here. Very good fruits. But I'm telling you, brethren, we can't get in there. There are people there who are so big that we looked like locusts. So we can't beat them. Those people are too big for us. But I thank God for the two young men, Joshua and Caleb. They were amidst them those who were sent to go and spy the land. They stood up and saw the way the people were weeping. They felt that vacuum within them. And they said, if this is what people are fearing, the giants, and they cried out and said, look, children of Israel, yes, it's true that we have giants there. But remember, God had already given us that land. And we are going to go there and face those giants. And we are going to make them like bread. And walk over them. And take that land. Yes. Hello. Amen. They, you know, they got angry about what people are perceiving about the great God I am. And so they said, no, we have to go there. And as you know, the whole story. Because of fear, because of murmuring and grumbling those who started the journey were unable to complete it. 
But we are saying that is not going to happen to us because we are receiving the word of God. We are receiving the power of God. We are receiving the anointing of God. We are receiving his true word, which is forever established in heaven. And this word is the one that is going to change our lives. It's the one which is going to renew our minds so that we may think the way God thinks. Now, God wants us to move from the natural to the supernatural. Meaning that there are some things we read in the Bible. We may not understand them as human beings. But these are true. And that God, to release his spirit in us, that we may think like him. When we think like God, meaning that what God desires us to have, then it becomes supernatural. It's beyond our uh, understanding. It's beyond. It goes just beyond our understanding. So if we want God to work in us, then we must believe that he's going to work in us to do that which we could not do on our own. So in the supernatural, and he wants us to, uh, to do according to his will. So as I summarize, God is doing a new thing. That one I want to assure you is doing a new thing even in this church here. And this church he has already decreed. And what he has decreed, he says he shall establish. So there's a, a sure word that that bamboo, this is the time for it. We have poked holes on it. And it's the time for it that God who has been with us all this time, he wants now the bamboo to shoot up. And when it shoots up, it, uh, it is not going to take years to see the trees. It takes weeks. Hello? It just takes weeks to, to mature. So, you have watered your family, you have watered your ministry, you have watered your own life for a very long time and have not seen anything coming out of it, you've reached a point, you've said, why me? You're asking yourself so many questions. But God is saying, but I'm with you. I'm just within you. And I'm around you, before you, behind you. All you have to do is turn to me and tell me, here I am, I have this and this and that, and God will start ministering to your life. All of us desire to be happy and successful, prosperous, but it's nothing compared to what God desires of us. He says, behold, from slavery to dominion, from ordinary to extraordinary, from natural doings to supernatural exploits. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who came on this earth, and he died. Jesus, he died. Just because of our sins. Our sins hinder us from knowing God. Our sins disconnect our spiritual realignment with God. And when he came, he came as a human being. So that his blood, just like the, the, the covenants they were making with animals and bulls, his blood may wash away our sins. In my tribe, they used to slaughter goats. And then they pour the blood. And my father would speak and say, I cover my children that no evil shall befall them. But that, the Bible says, does not amount to what he did to his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who was sinless. He became human being that you and I may understand the challenges we go through as human beings. And these challenges are so grave. These challenges, you may not even understand them. And that's why one feels deep inside. I'm talking about deep inside. The things that will make you cry the whole night and still nobody will understand you. There are things that you clutch your pillow and you make it wet 
and still nobody will understand you. But Jesus Christ, he came. That he may take away all that is painful to you. And the Bible says that he had to go through all the pains you and I go through. He had to walk the length and breadth of them all. And each time something happened to him, he had to take it inside him as a human being because he had to fulfill that which God had sent him to. And the wages of sin is death. And so the Father in heaven allowed him to come and take it from us. And he took every sinful nature you can imagine. Are you going through grief? He took that grief. Are you going through adultery? He took it up. Are you going through shame? He took it up. Are you going through rejection? He just took it up. And as he was going, he had agreed with the father that he'll complete the entire journey of all these burdens that were dogging the human race. And he carried them all. And the Bible says that he went up to the cross and on top of the cross, as he was carrying that cross, taking it up to Golgotha, uh, he could fall many times, but he was not ready to give up because he had not completed the journey. And he went up to the top of the cross, and before he could die, the Bible tells us that he looked up at his father, that now I have come to the end of what we agreed, you and me. Then when he looked up, the Bible says he saw the father had turned the other way around. And so he cried, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And the father could not look at him because he had the sinful nature in him. And the law is that the wages of sin is death. So he must die. And that's the time he'll complete the journey. And when he died, just before he let out his ghosts or his spirit, he says, all is finished. And he let go. And now, from that time forth, he was buried. For three days, he was in the tomb. And the father came and made him alive so that he'll be here with us that whenever I have a challenge of rejection, he was rejected, but now is alive to help me come out of rejection. And so he will not die again. In Revelation 1, 18, he says, I am he who was dead, but now I'm alive and alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys. So he's the one who has the key for your life. He's the one who has the key to open and shut the things that have messed your life and open a new door. Now, as I close, I would like to pray for those people. And I would also like to lead one or two people to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's not about me. It's not about Anybody, it's not about your friends, it's not about your relatives, it's just about your relationship with the Father in heaven. So I would like to have the, the family of two who have come to a dead end. They would come. I uh, would also like to pray with the family, this family here. I would like to pray... There's somebody I'm looking for. I'm not seeing that person here. Uh, I'd like to pray with a lady who deals with children. Um, yeah. I'll pray with those first, then we can have uh, those who would like to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So we may all stand up as we pray for those I've called. If you are here, please come. The Lord would want to do something in your life.